Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So it's already been a year ago again, huh? Yeah. That, yeah. Even slightly more that, that I talked here uh, on this, this topic. So I've got about one and a half hours, which I'd like to make, um, give also uh, um, the other speaker enough time to talk about um, his topic. So I've got a number of sheets, which I have heard that I, because of the times, I've, I've shortened it slightly. Um, but I'd also like to show a bit how it's done and, and actually show a simulator how, what I'm speaking about. So just to keep it a bit, a bit alive, not just uh, talk, talk, talk for one and a half hours. So I'll have two examples, which I'll show to you, one in, a, say, in a, about 30 minutes, and then in the end I will end off with a Fairphone example, which I think dovetails very nice with, with the, uh, the next speaker. I also have a, a title which I actually always challenge and so there's a big hype about circular economy and I always ask what, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what are the real losses and limits. Now We some, somehow get hyped away and we sometimes forget that we have to keep our feet on the ground. And that's what I'd like to show to you. Before I go there, let me just go before the first stride. This is where I come from. South Africa. I started my career in, in early 80s in the mining industry, the gold mining industry. And so I say this specifically because it gives you a context from where I'm coming. Why I say what I say. So it's been a long history. And it's always been there. We've been treating waste. My first job was actually remining an old gold dump to get gold out, which had historically high gold levels because the, the processes weren't that efficient. So I was a flotation operator, banging pipes, uh, doing all the stuff you do when you start your career. And, um, but then I went on uh, t to really do this, this uh, job of, of resources, um, metallurgist, recycling from that basis. And I've been basically around the world. And just just summary, and, and you'll get all these sheets, I'll give them, I'll give you the full length, all of the sheets. I've just taken a selection out now, uh, because originally I thought I would have three hours. <laughs> so I had to... Um, but I, I, I grew up in Stellenbosch, in South Africa. I worked on, in the industry there. I worked for Autotech for many years. Um, I was a professor in Holland, and also I still have an office as a professor in Melbourne, in, in Australia, um, and I've been in China as well, but now I'm in, in Germany as a director of that institute. Uh, the Helmholtz uh, organization is a 4.5 billion euro um, research organization in Germany, uh, which does uh, uh, research in that interface between industry and fundamental science. So there's the Fraunhofer, which is close to industry, there's the Max Planck, which is close to uh, the, very close to the science, and, and Helmholtz is somewhere in between. And there are 18 centers in, in Germany that do this. So it's a very nice model, and it's then linked very close to universities, uh, which then brings this academic uh, aspect to it. So I have a number of PhD students as well. So while I was speaking, you perhaps have had a, a chance to look through this. So at the end of this talk, you'll also get, when you have the sheets, you have a whole number of publications which we've done that are relevant to this topic. And so I've just highlighted a few here. We did the UNIP report on metal recycling, uh, which was downloaded and is still being downloaded many times. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. It's work I started doing while I was in Australia and I finished it while I was uh, here in, in ESPO and Autotech. And um, we've written a book on, on, on recycling. So have a look at those things because this is really what I'm gonna speak about. Um, in, in these couple of minutes. So I have four topics. I just quickly go into circular economies and I just remind people, hey, what's new? Um, I will show that in these first couple of sheets. I then will also show you a sheet we draw 20 years ago and it's basically the same. So I always ask what's new? Metallurgists have always been recycling can get gold out of anything, you'll get it out if there's an economic value. I'd like to just go into the, the tools and then I'll, I'll show you an example. 
um, specifically uh, um, from the primary side, what you can already do, what the tools are available to do, to evaluate from a resource side and an energy side, what is the baseline? But if you don't have a good baseline, what the hell are you basing your economics on? So as I said, there's a lot of fuzziness out there that, that is being said, but you have to drill down to the depth to get a good number to make sure that we are talking uh, sense. Then I'll show you uh, a quick example, which I've now pruned to only two sheets on LED lamp recycling, which we did a couple of years ago. And then a recent example, Fairphone, which then I dovetails to the, the talk after mine. This is, you'll see some publications at the bottom. I just, every then, now and then I've referenced stuff where this comes from. Just go to the origins. Um, I always, see in, in your age, you go to the internet and you're going to drill down to some site and you think that's the truth. Um, but the oldest textbook in, in metallurgy was written in Freiburg and in 1556. And there are some pictures in there. And gold recycling was mentioned even then. Nothing new. The Chinese had a very similar type of book. It's called Heavenly Creations. If you just compare the two pictures, here's the Chinese version. And this is the beauty of our trade. It, if you go around the world, it's, you can contact with a good metallurgist. We'll always be speaking to a good metallurgist. Know where, whichever languages you do, you'll get together. Now, this is the beauty of our field. We are connected by metals resources. That makes us really key, key players in the circular economy field. Obviously, you can speak about circular economy of sharing stuff. Then you can ask, well, well, what have we been doing with hotels for many years? What are we doing with trains? What are we doing with, with kitchens? We've been sharing stuff for many, many, many years. But ultimately, you've got materials that are running this, this show, the energy as well. So we've been mining this stuff for many years, but obviously we are limited. So we have to recycle. We have to bring stuff back. We have to design stuff better. And I will just focus on that aspect. Um, uh, just from a good old process metallurgical engineering point of view. Just to show to you, guys, if we don't get down to the basics, circular economy is a great idea. It's been around for ages. Nature has been doing it for ages. But we have to get down to the detail to understand it, not get carried away with stuff that will lose its steam if it's not thought out very well. So also sustainability is nothing new. And the first book on really sustainability was also written in the same area in Freiburg. And it's about tree, uh, the, the management of trees, because they were mining all the trees. That was having catastrophic effects on building and, and having logs up, obviously, also for, um, uh, for the mines itself. So they had to manage this. So von Karlowitz wrote that book sustainable culture of, of, uh, of trees. So go and read the stuff. Don't just go and Google stuff, go and read the, the old stuff. There's a lot of old stuff around. Then I just uh, come back to make a closed loop once to my own uh, background. This is then, well, those books have been written 300 years ago. And, and this is where I come from, close to Cape Town, where this tree was, was, was planted uh, 300 years ago. Or well, in 1700, sorry. It's, it's, um, but so, guys, uh, um, we, we've been looking after and we've been trying to do this for many years. And I, and I, I mention it also specifically because Anglo American, which you know as a corporation, actually owns that, that, that site there, where, where they're actually also protecting uh, uh, nature where they can. So this is also another link, and perhaps I've shown this uh, in the past, but it's an interesting one. Uh, Freiberg has had, is, is an old mining school, so it's had links globally already many years ago. So the, the person that opened up the mine in, 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 in Kosaka in Japan was a person from Freiberg in the year 1873. And by chance, I got involved in the smelter in 2008. Autotech or Osmelt had built the smelter to do e-waste smelting. Kosaka, if you go and look at the website, is a Odawa corporation at such. 
is, is a, a circle economy company. If you're going to look at their website, go and have a look. And the key technology is this reactor, which, which closes the loop, takes various uh, materials in and processes them, and then refines them to high-grade materials. So it's, once again, nothing new. So what is, what is new in this whole circular economy? You need all of this technology to make it work. As I said, uh, um, Autotech is actually um, the owner of the technology now, but it originated in Australia, in Melbourne. So that's the globalness of our field. So it's, it's all linked. And you have to, if I may ask, you have to, when you speak about circular economy, make sure that you read as much as you can. Don't just go and Google stuff. Be a good student and go and read the stuff, the really good stuff, and, and really understand how things are linked, because then you can really change things. Otherwise, we'll just be doing what, what we've always been doing, you know, sharing beds in, in a hotel. That is uh, also um, circular economy in the sense of a business model of, of, of uh, obviously reducing uh, impact. So I, always, I also show this example because I put it and I sent it last year as well and I show it each time again because I put this in the UNOP report on metal recycling as a, as a case, the last one on page so 300 something. And people don't realize this. We are speaking about circular economy, um, but we have to live it as well. The, the really, circular economy is, is, is philosophically very deep. Think about it. It's not just making money. It's, it's, it's part of nature. But then we drink our coffee each day. So we speak about circular economy, but when we drink coffee, it's linear economy. We drink it and we forget. Our body takes care of it. But have you ever thought the reverse? And now you have seen it, and I pose that question to you. Reverse that process economically. Go from the cup of coffee back into sugar, coffee, milk, water, economically. Now then you get really to the heart of the, the problem. How do you separate stuff again? Whatever you think of circular economy, ultimately material is the base and it somehow has to come back. Whatever nice picture you take from the internet, ultimately you have to bring it back. Think of this example. If you drink a cup of coffee in the morning, think of how can I make that circular? Just think of all the cups we are creating. Oh, there are various companies, I won't main, mention names. How many zillions of cups we're just putting out there in the, in the waste paper bin? That's one issue. But how we deal with complex mixtures, that's the essence. I will show that to you with, specifically with the Fairphone example. How do you deal with a complex mixture of materials that have got a functionality that is creating a service in the circular economy and ultimately, that platform has to come back again. And how do we get everything back again from those complex mixtures? Whichever way you argue, ultimately, you have to do that. Because materials have to come from somewhere and they have to flow. They flow and they have that functionality. And somewhere they have to come back. And because of, obviously, um, and I'll show this to you in a, in a moment, metals are connected, so there are limitations of how much they are outside and how much we can actually get from the mines. We have to take very care, good care of how do we balance that primary, secondary side and, and balance that in the bigger picture. And that's why I want to show to you the models, how you could perhaps do that. And there are not many people around that do this, but here in Finland, we've been pushing this through Autotech, through Alto, uh, to, to bring this thinking. Uh, and that is also our drive in the EIT kick raw materials to put that in, to teach young people to think this way. And hopefully, I can uh, sh open up that window slightly for you, and then you uh, hopefully will jump on the train and, and, and join us. So this is the classical picture of circular economy, among others, adapted from the EU. What is missing? S um, spot what is not there. It's as if metals just, what? Excuse me? Uh, there's a lot of stuff there, but what is, <clears throat> what is totally missing is recovery of metals from primary ores. Th there's this whole metallurgy area over here. Um, just hang on. If you, can you see something? No, this curse is... It's just gone. P 
people magically in the EU think that metals pop out of a box, come into products and pop back out again. That's what that picture is conveying. So if you really want to bring stuff together, we have to harmonize primary production with the production of materials from primary secondary sources. Then look at the design, and I'll show that to you today. Uh, Remanufacture is, is one as aspect that is important, but ultimately material has to come back some t at some point. We have to collect, which is what, what will be spoken about. If you don't mine the mine, you don't have material. So up in the top left, you have the geological mine, the collection, you have the urban mine. But ultimately, stuff comes together and you have materials and you have to take them apart again. But what else is missing here? What is glaringly missing? And have a look at all the documents. What drives this system? Energy. So there's an energy infrastructure that feeds energy into that. It's got a lot of metals in the infrastructure itself, but it feeds into it. And go and have a look at how many documents, and, and I think the documents are starting to come out where they, this is more discussed. But ultimately, if you don't have energy, forget it. And how does that interact? In other words, you see at the top there's residual um, waste once the infrastructure is returning back into the metals cycle to get the metals out. But the processing itself brings the metals back into the system for that infrastructure to exist. So there's an energy flow for power. There's an energy flow within the materials. There's an entropy flow which has to be quantified. And that all constitutes to ultimately the basis of the economics of the system. So you have energy people speaking, but they forget of resources. Somehow materials just, as I said, just pop out of a box. They're somewhere, we can buy them. You have to look at this very carefully. How's the balance of materials flowing into it, flowing out to do whatever you like? And then ultimately you can ask yourself the question, which is the better lamp? The LED or the, just the old, old uh, lamp? The one has got a lot of materials, the left-hand one, the right-hand side has less materials. Which is better? Those are the fundamental questions one has to ask to really understand the system. And ultimately there's no hand-waving. You have to quantify it. And I'll show that uh, to you very briefly today. So ultimately, the picture that we have to look at is this interaction of resources, as shown in the center, with the energy. Materials flow into that infrastructure. Energy flows into the resource sector. We have residual waste flowing from the energy into the resource sector, which we have to deal with. But ultimately, what we'd like to do is to minimize the residual waste, ultimately, that we create. Now that's not easy, as you'll see a bit later today. I will try to visual, visualize that for you with two concrete examples uh, that we've done. And then you have to really ask yourself, in each endeavor that you take, have you calibrated and quantified the, the losses of your system well, and can you manage the losses? And I always say that because I learned very early in my career as, as when I was in my early 20s when I started working on the gold mines. In the end, it's about not only the gold that you take out, it's about the residues you create, the legacy you leave behind as a mine. It's the legacy we leave behind on all the waste dumps that we're creating, all this plastic in the oceans. It's been, learned, been known for a long time, but it's there. Now people are starting to wake up. Why does it happen? Plastic mixtures are too complex. You, need, you don't just recycle them. You, if, if they're too complex, the mixture, if the cup of coffee is too complex, you recover the energy from it. Quite simple. But then you need the energy infrastructure to do that, which also costs money. So it's a, it's a very complex interaction to deal with it. In the end, we must get beyond just lobbying for materials. You have to understand how these materials fit together and what you can get back. And obviously, materials fit together to create a functionality, great. But then we have to be brutally honest of how much we can actually get back again and, and actually get to the truth of that. And that's your generation, you have to deal with it. And we're trying to create the tools for you. 
uh, and, and my students as well, uh, I've come from Odotec back to academia to help me to create some missing models that I need to calibrate the system to understand it better. So, um, ultimately what I would like to show to you is this digitalization bit, the platform, where we are, how we can link it all together, but also speak about the fundamental processing infrastructure that is required to make this all work. So in summary, we've got another picture, and I'd like to use that as the center, um, which is basically other, other colors just of the previous one, but let me just summarize what I said uh, in, in a, moment, uh, a moment ago. So we start up, that's the exploration bit, the mining bit, the physical processing, but you can see we've added extractive metallurgy there to, to actually show the complete picture. Then we have product design, etc. So ultimately, you've got a complex mineral, and you, we can deal with it. That's, that's a copper mineral, chocopyrite. We can analyze it. That's a photo from our own lab. It's a um, MLA, mineral liberation analysis equipment. We've got two in the lab where you actually analyze the ore, and you know if you crush it, how it liberates, and where what mineral is situated so you can separate it better. You need to measure. You need fundamental data. So we can speak about circular economy, but we don't have the fundamental data, so what? We're just fluttering around in, 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 in space somewhere. Then some pictures, you'll see those are come, uh, come again, but uh, this is just to show that you need to understand also the, the, the extraction of those metals from whichever resource, be it a remanufactured part, end of life bit, uh, just residue that's created on the path of that circular economy. That is all the waste that is created at the power plant. What I do with the ashes, where does it go? It's all part of the system. You can't just keep your eyes closed. You need to look at the waste that is created everywhere in the system. Not just create and say, well, I've got this beautiful solution. I've used 50% plastic in the product. But you forget to say where the other 50% is and how much residue you've created wherever it is in the world. Those are crucial questions. Because if you want to make it work, we have to know where, what, what residues we are creating where. To understand that residual waste is not just of this process stream, it's of all the processes that are involved. It's also even the waste we create when we, we rub off the rubber from a tire. I don't know if you know what's all in a tire, but among other zinc oxide. So you, you're rubbing off the rubber plus the zinc oxide goes lost. So you have to know all of that stuff to understand the circular economy system well. And if you don't, let me speak in the negative. If one does not understand it, you cannot do a good design. And as a process engineer, if you, like we did do at Autotech, you present the process design on a good fundamental basis so that you can get a good capex, opex indication of that. If you can't do that for the system, you, you should uh, re-examine uh, what, what you do. So here, this is a picture from, from Autotech as well. So we've di Autotech has digitalized the platforms. They can control plants. We can simulate the plants, and I'll show you this example in a moment. This is from, from ore to, to concentrate, from concentrate to metal. And this has evolved many years. You'd be surprised that there are so many people speaking about circular economy, but they don't know this stuff anymore. So you guys sitting here have to convey that information as being a key part of the circular economy discussion. You need to go to that detail, or one needs to go into that detail. So then suddenly, and that's what I, that is why I have these two pictures, so we have a very detailed understanding up till there. Then I say, well, they know the CAD guys, the computer-aided design people, that are bringing stuff together, it's very sophisticated tools, to make that product work. So ideally, we'd like to link CAD with our design models to start closing the loop. In other words, we create the metals, they flow into the system. It's partially done through lifecycle assessment tools but as you'll see a bit later on, the life cycle assessment tools have got their limitations. Then we have the industry 4.0, the whole robotics, etc. Et but have you asked yourself the question, 
of all the materials that flow in there, when it gets obsolete, where does it go? And what do, how do we deal with that? So we can speak about Industry 4.0, but if we don't see the big picture, are we thinking circular economy? Those are the things we have to bring together. And then we have the design for recycling people that suddenly use Excel sheets. So we go from thermodynamics, simulator, and then we just degrade to Excel sheets. And, and they say, hey guys, this is not how we can bring things together. So we need this type of tool to map the whole system. Because ultimately, and this is the key of this, of this talk, and I've been advocating this for 20 years, but hopefully it starts getting through, that we can describe an ore mineral and we can simulate it. But then if we do design for recycling, we use Excel models, very simple ones. But I will show to you at the end of the talk that if you have the bill of materials, the material declaration of a product, it's very much like the mineralogy. If the tools are the same, we can calculate the performance of the system. We can feed back that to the design. Then we have true design for recycling. We can look at the entropy of the system, the energy balance of the system, etc. And that's where we need to go. If you want to make that picture work, resource, energy together, whichever circular economy business model you have, ultimately you need material somewhere. Even if you've got a platform with your little app on it, you're still using metals. So you have to understand how your platform performs in this bigger picture to really understand, are you truly doing circle economy? Or you're just making business model out of a small bit of it and talking circular economy talk to make it topical for the present age. So I might be just making some provocative statements. If you want to jump into my face, please do that. But this is also interesting. My colleague and I, in which uh, we've been doing this for, for many years, um, uh, there was an interesting uh, paper in 2016, and you can see who was who did the foreword is uh, Emmanuel Macron. He was pushing. So there's some leaders out there that are really pushing for stuff. Finland is pushing for it, but also Emmanuel Macron. And so what I'm also trying to, to explain to you in, in, in the rest of this talk is, is to look at um, uh, what type of infrastructure do you need to make it, and what infrastructure of metallurgy do you need what tools do you need? What digitalization do you need? What data do you need to make this work? And that's part of that, that paper in, this, in the same journal at that time. So you see, there's a lot of good stuff happening, but we just must do it right. We don't have time to waste. So um, uh, the one message I would like to give to cut to the chase, go through the woods and go, go as far as you can to the, to, to the basics of your system to get good answers. And that's what we've been trying to do here. And there's some literature in the back. And I just wanted to remind you at this point that there's a lot of literature at the back that you can read, which I um, will, I think I've sent a, lot, sent a lot to you. OK, let's go to the next point. Now let's get to the tools, just to show what you need to do. And I'll go through certain of this stuff very fast, because in view of, of time. Um, you know, at, at <laughs> We had an interesting time. When was it? Four years, five years ago? At that time, there was HSC 6 or 7. seven I think, yeah. And it was crashing because we were creating a very large model. Yeah, and we were really working hard at it. And you were actually part of that development. We were pushing the boundaries of, of the system. But you'll see in a moment how much, far, how much further we've gone. So it's from 7 to 9. And what is of interest? This is stuff I, I uh, had uh, added to the software, specifically that you can analyze the fundamentals. Obviously, energy, exergy. We put in LCA, and that I'll show to you live in a moment. And obviously, it's all thermodynamic based. Um, then I also added MLA, uh, mineral liberation analysis, because you need to know the mineralogy of the system. That's classical geology tools that, that the, the mining industry uses. But we also have to be mindful and useful 
or use these types of tools also from for the um, for our uh, sort of consumer products that the OEMs produce. Now, uh, but you don't have to have a really MLA. If you've got a bill of materials, you've got the mineralogy. And I'll show to you how you can, can deal with that. So ultimately, with these tools, we'd like to understand you know, uh, the baseline, where we are, which is this, this line over here. Where is our technology now? Where do we want to go? It's the green. Now we want to innovate, but where do we want to innovate from and where to? What is the baseline? And we, we sort of hand wave often. And I always ask, hey, hey guys, where are we? Where are we in space? Are we that bad or are we at a limit? And and can we really go further this way? Are we hitting the brick wall, wide, eyes wide open? So must we rather not talk <clears throat> about all this technology stuff, but speak about how do we change our, our behavior, how, how we deal with products, how we deal with stuff in general? Should we just change our mindset totally? Because if we know we can't get any better than this, perhaps we can get even a bit better, but there's some, what's the brick wall? Can anybody tell me what, what's the brick wall of our society? Can anybody quantify that? And usually there's a lot of circular economy talk, but nobody can really give me that answer. Where are we in, in the biggest space of things? And so this is what this picture tries to, to show, and you can read that in the one paper. So ultimately, and I've, this is a slightly uh, then redrawn figure of the, of the previous one, just showing that we have to understand resource, energy, efficiency in, in processes. We have to bring that all together. Whichever way we're looking at it, because whatever you're going to say, somehow you're going to use materials. Even if it's the power to drive your app, because there's a power station or there's a uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, system somewhere, windmills, whatever. It's somehow linked. Now these are pretty, pretty complex systems. And people will say, oh, it's all too complex. And I always say, hey, come on, guys, if we don't get home to complexity, we're just frothing around and, and just talking bullshit, really. So, um, sorry for that word, but that's what it is in the end. So, let me just, uh, just bring you what do you need to know to really make this work. And we drew this figure many years ago where we, in this case, we went from a body in white. We did a lot of stuff work, uh, so work uh, at that time in, in car recycling. And so we got also close to the, uh, the OEMs. So there you have a body in white uh, of, uh, of an EU project at the time, Superlight Car. And then we were trying to model where do particles go? If I shred it, must I shred it? If I shred it, where, what particles do I create and where do these particles ultimately land? Because that ultimately determines the losses, the true losses of the system. Not the legislative or policy losses, the true losses the thermodynamic technology losses, which ultimately take away your profit, the profit of the system. That's what you like to quantify. And this picture then shows that you have a designed, uh, in this case, body in white, and then you separate the stuff, and then it is separated to the different metallurgical processes as shown over there. Um, and these are all basically <coughs> auto -tech uh, technologies that, that, that uh, are on the market and are in industrial practice. So it's nothing new there. But also, if I do have modules, like if, if we have e-mobility, we have a battery, we, don't, we wouldn't shred it. We would take it out and put it in the right stream, perhaps take a few stuff off and then immediately recycle it. So these are the questions, modularity vis-a-vis -vis shredding things to bit. And now that is your PhD, is to understand that balance. Huh? How much entropy do I create with particles? And that's, we just talked about your paper yeah. a moment ago, so you'll be setting that out soon. So this is continuing this discussion, but on a more fundamental basis. To shred or not to shred, modular design or not modular design, refurbishment, but ultimately refurbished, but there's a residue. So where, where does that refurbished old bit go to? It has to go somewhere. So is there infrastructure? 
Um, is there enough infrastructure to deal with the complexity of all the metals? That's the question that has to be answered. So then I also hear something very, very close uh, to, to also um, Alto um, and Autotech as such. We then, remember I, that those dates were about 20, uh, 15 years ago. So this is, has evolved to actually modeling the system. In this case, we looked at, you see a little screen there in the center, which you can't really read at all, but it shows you a simulation of an e-waste recycling physical recycling plant. And it's specifically done at Kusokoski, not far from here. And actually we've got the recycling models. Now, I've heard so many times over the years, it's all too difficult. And I said, hey, now I've got a nice example. I say, hey guys, we've already done it. And it's not too difficult, but if we don't start, we won't get there. So it's the challenge I put to you guys, how do you digitalize this whole system? What ingenuity will you have to to create the platforms to actually do this. And I say this specifically because my first job when I was younger than you, I, I started off in industry with, two, I was about 22, 23. So my master project was the optimization of flotation plants. At that time, theory just started to develop how to deal. If I go back, how to deal with particles in the system. There were some very bright guys and at that time in South Africa that were world leading that, were, that I got taught by that gave me my basis to think in this way. But it, remember, it's end of 70s, early 80s. So it's a long time to get all this stuff done. So we've taken that whole body of knowledge and transformed it to the recycling field. And, and this is where we are now, uh, as I said. We are, and it's still got a lot of holes in it but hopefully we can attract a few people to actually take part in, in actually creating more detailed models that will permit us to, to better uh, understand the system. Some pictures I've shown this to you, you need to know some metallurgy. So you, the beauty of circle economy is you have, to be, you have to know one or two things really in depth, but you have to know the whole field as well, pretty much also in depth. But you can be really expert in, in one or two stuff to make sure that you can really make a change. But unfortunately, you also have to, if you do min proc, you also have to know, know pyrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy, uh, generally processing, engineering, economics uh, to make it work. So this is what this picture would, would, would show. And I was involved in, in various of these uh, solutions and, and still am in, in, in a way. Now we speak about big data, another thing. Uh, interesting thing when I came to Alto, my first paper that I ever did, I was done here in Alto at the, at the uh, what's, what's the university, Helsinki University of Technology. At that time, there was this hype of neural nets and big data. That was 30 years ago. Now only it's, it's, it's coming into mainstream. So I'm just showing to you old stuff we did. This stems about 25 years ago, some of these pics. Big data, in other words, how do you link fundamental models with big data? Not just big data to what Google does, but actually link it to process and, and try to optimize um, the system by using these different techniques, sort of harmonizing stuff. That's why I show this. But you also need to know so computational fluid dynamics. You have to know what's going on in the reactors. These are some pictures of work uh, I was involved in directly with PhD students, but also at Autotech, to understand how to optimize a reactor. So you need to know that as well. I'm not an expert in CFD, but I know enough to be part of a team to actually get down to the detail, getting good data. Then you need to have some thermodynamic information. So this is a, a paper we wrote, an overview of, of stuff just to show, and, and this has now uh, been uh, also increased the knowledge. If you look all the, the primary side, there's a lot of information over here, but in the secondary side, there's only now being measurements done. We, so we did it but also here at Alto, there's also a reasonable body of data that has been now created to understand where metals go in, in a reactor. So here, this is primary side, a lot of work in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and now only recently have we started to, to create the data. And as I said, Alto, uh, one, one of the colleagues here is actually doing a lot of work in this to make it, to get it. And then also here, the same thing, we've been looking at lead. This, the first one was for copper, this was, the other one was for lead. So, 
to summarize that all, to explain to people that are not metallurgists what this all means, um, we created this metal wheel already um, uh, in end of the 90s. Uh, that was at the time in Delft. And the, what it was trying to show already that time, if you don't have this ring of metallurgy over here, this blue one, which is for me really the ball bearing of, of the metal side of society. If any of these little bits and pieces, any of these elements fall away because legislation doesn't want it to be here. For instance, lead is coming under strain again. If any of those fall away, you can obviously, it's clear that your wheel won't turn anymore. So if you do circular economy, you have to not just go up into the sky, you have to also make sure that you don't throw the, the, the baby out with the, with the water because you need the metallurgy to make it work. So we all want to do the, all this fancy stuff, but we, don't, we forget all this basic old technology is still required to make it happen. And this is what this picture sh was trying to show. And then obviously also here I've taken out the copper bit to show the importance of copper just in the cycle. It's not only supplying metals, but it's also dissolving them like in a cup of coffee. But the nice of a cup of coffee or a cup of copper coffee would be that I can capture those elements and release them again through recycling. A cup of coffee is, is, is slightly more complex. So, but you can read of this because it has a long history. So as I said, these tools have evolved over many years. I show this to you specifically because in the moment I just will go, because I've got another half an hour, I'll just jump to, to Windows and will show to you um, uh, how, the, how this looks like. This is just the architecture of, of the model, which, um, and I, with this picture, I just want to show basically that we have a simulator here, but it's linked to various databases. And these are thermochemical databases. It's not just data. It's not just data for big data sense. It's thermochemical data, so you can go down to the fundamentals of the process. So this is what this just shows. There's a lot of stuff feeding in into the flow sheet that I'll show in a moment. There are many species at present. When you just used it, there was much, much, much less. There's a lot happened since, since you last used it. So in summary, what I'd like to, to then show to you uh, in, in a couple, uh, two, three sheets, then going to, to Windows is that we have on the one hand the design tool. Remember, this is Circular Economy Design Forum. So this is the design side. You design a flow sheet. You design a system. Um, not just a plant, but a plant of plants. Bring it together. In this case, it's simple. It was just a, a Oritec silver refinery. What we've added to the functionality, it's the first thing I did when Osmelt got bought by Ototech. I phoned Auntie and said, I'd like also it to link to the environmental software, LCA tool, so that we can evaluate the footprint of our process. But we've even gone further. So usually we do CapEx, OpEx, energy, but we've expanded this also to include exergy and thermoeconomics. I don't know if you know what the word thermoeconomics implies. It's basically mixing entropy and economics and understanding where processes are really hurting, where the losses are, but you express it not in, in, in only in monetary terms, but also you understand it in terms of the entropy creation at those, those points. So why is this so important? Because remember I said energy, resources. So how do you bring the system together? You understand it in terms of enthalpy, but also entropy. In other words, free energy. So you bring it together. Go and check any of the f circular economy pictures if they ever speak of the word free energy minimization. Probably not. Entropy is also scarce. There are special editions on circular economy in some well-known journals. I want to mention your names. I even went to the editor. Why, why do you use the word entropy in any of the papers? Thick, thick books, but a lot of academic high-impact factor stuff. Where's the word entropy? You don't hardly find it. 
So there's a lot of waste of paper, and we're not going down to the detail. So hopefully, when you do your work, you will go beyond just paper. Okay, so let me uh, then stop for a moment here and then go to HSC. Um, and I would just like to show to you what this previous picture looks like in, in real terms, okay? To just get a feel. So hopefully I can get this running pretty fast. So I'm just going out of my good old... Uh, let me just go out. Restarted in, in boot, boot camp. It's pretty nice what Apple has done. So what I'd <clears throat> like to show to you, you remember your copper example? Yes, quite well. Quite well. So uh, you'll see how far we can now do it. Remember some issues you had at that time, which gave you some sleepless nights? And so we s try to solve it, and, and it, in the end we could do the LCA on it, yeah. which I did, I think. Uh, you yeah. Did, uh, I yeah. At that time. So even that, four or five years, huh? It's a long time to get stuff done. So it just doesn't happen. Just, I'm just starting this software. So what I'm now going to show to you is the first bit of the flow sheet. I go from resource to metal. The second example, I will go from Fairphone as a product and back to metal. So I'm going to first do the top bit of that diagram I showed you, and then I'm going to turn it around. And so obviously it just is clear that you would then um, understand that you can close the whole loop with the same tool. So let me just hope this doesn't crash now. So it's actually loading, but you can see already, and I, le I let it run before you because you can see how large this model is. Um, and I will just zoom into certain little blocks uh, to, to just show to you what the detail is. And, and the message I would like to, to, to leave with you, the front end is based on minerals. So I have the mineralogy, the composition of minerals. And in the end, I will have the whole entropy enthalpy of, of the, the flow sheet as it is, is run. Okay, so here we are. So, so here we start with an ore. It, it's just going to take some time if I just click on that, but I'll show to you some of the, the what's behind. So you have a model behind it, a separation model, flotation model that tells you where what goes. Um, if I run it, I just, I've, I've run it, but I will show to you what's inside here. Each of these streams contain minerals. So we've kept it simple because ultimately the, the test here is, is to look at thermoeconomics, but here you find three minerals are flowing through the system, creating a concentrate. <coughs> and it's chocopyrite, dolomite, and quartz flowing through that system. This goes then to the metallurgy, primary copper smelting. Goes through a flash smelter, Autotech technology, and all this is, uh, you can get it uh, from Autotech. If you zoom into it, double click on it, you will find thermochemical data. And I'd like just to leave that message with you. There's a th the total enthalpy flow, but there's also the chemical exergy physical actually exergy and the total exergy. It's in the system. So it's the message I'm trying to give. If you want to understand the system, please go to the detail of it. Because that's what we do in the primary side. But we can also do it in the secondary side as you'll see in a moment. So, then we go to gas cleaning. So this is not so much circular economy, this is just good practice when you are creating a proposed process flow sheet, you try to get as much material back. 
So you have off-gas treatment, you recover energy. You get dust back. If there's a valuable element in the dust, let me just click on one of these. So here's, here's some duffs, you get some metals in the dust. So they're in gaseous form and later they become, they oxidize and they become uh, solids. But you have to recover them to deal with it. Then we have sulfuric acid plant. We capture the sulfur and we create sulfuric acid. We have copper secondary smelting. So a big copper smelter also has secondary smelting. It takes e-waste, it takes batteries, it takes stuff and brings it together to produce metal in the electrolysis. The energy or the steam that you create creates energy. You use it. You, you deal with other wastes like slags and batteries and whatever. You put it in an electric furnace, you recover the metals from it. That's this example. You have an oxygen plant because you need oxygen, but the oxygen production plant has, is linked to the power station. You've got the footprint there, You've got residue there, so you have to bring it all together. One big system. So it's, it's evolved quite some bit. Then you always obviously recover the precious metals if they are in there. Precious metal refiner. And now, as you see, you can each time see that there's something behind there. It's going from rock to particles, minerals, to, to molten material, then it's dissolution, refining, as shown over here. So it's, as you can see, it's, it's evolved considerably of the last year. Excuse me? Yeah, but I mean, it's, yeah, but you can put it all together. So it just shows to you. Okay, now, the number of tools. And I just would like to, to show you uh, this one or that one. And then there's this thermal economic calculator. It's already in there. So if you want to analyze systems, we've put it in here. So we just submitted the paper well, in next, next week after the um, Easter weekend. But here's LCA ev evaluation, life cycle assessment evaluation. And I can click on it and I can start doing the life cycle assessment. So I go from rock to metal, I have the energy flow, I've got the entropy flow, I've got the th thermoeconomics, but at the same time I can get the footprint of it, the CO2 equivalent, the SOX equivalent, or the uh, acidification potential, eutrophication potential, etc. And I do that by exporting it to the tools over here, which are among others called GABI. There are a few other tools, so we just selected Gavi. We also have Open LCA. At, you can export it to Excel and then import it wherever you like. But this is where we are. So what I'm leaving you with, uh, with one of the messages, if you now tell me this is all too difficult, can't be done, I, I, you, I, you might just get a smile from my face. So we can do it. You can evaluate your systems in this detail. Uh, you can add the collection up front if you want. You can get the footprint of the collection and, and the losses at the collection. Calculate the entropy with your, with your entropy calculation, which is it's all there so that your input will also flow into this software through Alto to Autotech. Okay, I've left you for the moment there. So now I'd like to go to the other bit of the circle, that is, let's look at a product. So here we have an ore that is a mineral, put it in, but let's take a product, we put it in. And as I said, it, then it's very easy to see, I can link the whole cycle. And so we're trying to push the limits of the software, see how far we can go. So please help us with that. Come, come to the auto, go to Autotech and, and come, come to us or do a joint project and we just do it and, and see how far we can go. Because these are the questions that you have to answer if you have your feet on the ground. Uh, and, and engineers, uh, do have their feet on the ground. Okay, so let me just go out there and go jump back to, um, to the two examples, and then I'm, then I'm done. I, I think I'll make, make the time, so um, you will have enough time to, to also give a good talk. And, and don't get me wrong, this is really beautifully fixed together. Huh? Uh, um, and, if you can combine these two, this is the type of research one, one can do and bring together. 
and, and it's true to that, that figure of the whole cycle. Collection is one of them. Remen is another aspect of it, but the losses as well. Okay. At least uh, Apple starts up very much faster than Windows sometimes, so, so that's one advantage. So remember, this is really, really nice to be able to go backwards and forth like this. It's a pretty large file, it's 250 megabytes, so it, it will take some time. Okay, as I said, now I'm going to do two uh, electronics products which have to be considered very much in the same way um, as um, as in the classical way. We have a mineral, but now we have designed minerals, consumer minerals, and I have two cases. And one is lamp recycling. I've, I've shortened it a bit in view of time. Um, the three sheets, but I'd just like to drive home the following. So in, in the previous example, we had a mineral over here. We had chocopyrite. Now I'm putting an LED lamp there, which has got its mineralogy. I can design that. I know which minerals and metals I bring together to, to create the functionality. I can do the system simulation. I showed that to you a moment ago. Then I can calculate the recoveries of each element, each compound, whatever. I can do the life cycle assessment as I showed to you. But the interesting thing is, how do we con uh, convey this complexity to the consumer? So we, a colleague and I, we came up with this recycling index, which you can clearly see comes from the energy label. We just bent it around in a circular economy fashion. We just, um, and that's how it came about. The difference between the energy label and this one, this one's got a scale. It goes from zero to 100%. The energy label is, is, is hanging around a bit. So um, this is what I'm going to show to you. The first example is sp simply the LED. In other words, I showed to you the car the previous time. Now here we have the LED, the design, the lamp. And then it, those scrap particles that you see on the right-hand side are pictures that we took. We actually went uh, to the plant. Uh, we photographed the stuff, we calibrated models, so this is not all theoretical, it's, it's those are the stuff how we've quantified the models. Those are just pictures to prove that. So capacitors at the bottom, circuits boards at the top, and then sort of copper coils and in the center just as an example. Then the, the question was which of these designs is best in terms of material recovery? Not just the energy label, but material recovery. So these were the, the five redesigns of those five lamps. The pictures at the bottom, once again, our pictures, which we took, my colleague and I, to actually calibrate the model, to understand what the scrap looks like, if you shred it a bit to bits and pieces. And then the middle one, it shows you if you would dismantle it. Uh, um, it's not totally correct, but it's if you would um, crush it in a way and then sort it out by hand, you get these very nice heaps. And at the bottom are the heaps after the separation plant. So the idea was which lamp is the best from a recycling point of view. And so there was this feedback. This was part of an EU project. It was a feedback of here's a design, check its recyclability, calculate it, go and check it on a plant and calculate what, it, what the recyclability is. 
So, um, long story short, there's, there's an example. Then we use this recycling index there for the first time to actually show what the different designs, design A is the best, B and Ds uh, is, is from 40 to 50 percent material recovery, and then there's this design E, which is from 10 to 20 percent. We just kept the, the, the margin rough because it's rather hard to measure scrapper. Huh? And then we just put in the bulb there as a comparison. So the question of circular economy is not just to, we all go for LED lamps, or we go this fad or that fad, or whichever fad. We have to calculate what's good. And just don't just politic it through, policy it through, and uh, um, lobby it through. Calculate it, and then come to an informed decision. And once again, I show this. Obviously, this is the, the center one is the materials, but the outside is obviously the LED lamp has got a different energy footprint than obviously an incandescent or just a normal bulb. So you have to look at both at the same time. So that is basically the message of, of this first example. The detail of it you can read in the, one of the publications I sent to you guys. So to end off this um, whole discussion, let me then uh, go to the Fairphone example, which was very interesting because we've been wanting to do, do this for many years. And by chance, as life goes, Fairphone actually approached us. And, can, can you calculate what the recycling rate, the true recycling rate of our product is? Can you feed back design rules so we can prove it? And yeah, we said, OK, what we need is the full bill of materials. <coughs> You'll probably appreciate that any large company will never give its bill of materials away. So it's, it's, it's their current rules huh? uh, of, of how they make a product. But a company inside it, if they've got CAD, they could link it to our models and calculate the true recycling rate, and therefore do true design for recycling and truly understand what and how much materials they can get back. That's the question. That's each company can do that internally. So get away from greenwashing, but actually do it. And even if you do it internally, try to improve your products. This is actually what Fairphone did then in the open, which was quite courageous, as a matter of fact. So once again, I come to this, uh, this, um, this, this title is, how do we inform society to buy product A, B, C? You saw that our models are pretty complex. So you can't confront the general population with, with a simulation model. So you have to make it visual. So as I said, we, we came up with these symbols to show on the one hand, um, we'd like to go from that, this dark gray area to some green area, but we, we may not greenwash. Huh? We must prove what we say. And that is rather key in this discussion, to get good numbers. So here I come then to the, the, the final example, uh, which you then can also link back to their web page. And I've got the links in there. So if I give you the PDF, you can just click on the blog one, which is more than a year ago. And the blog two was, was less than a year ago, but still is very much relevant. This is a presentation I did for Fairphone on their, on their, um, on their sheets. Um, to explain what we've done. Those are the, my colleague and, and also the, the, the person, Miguel Ballester from, from Fairphone, that actually has done this, or what was the lead in it. So ultimately, we had this report on recyclability. You can download it. You can read all of this stuff. The interesting thing is, as well, this uh, company got the environmental prize from the German government for, for their design for recycling um, uh, work. Because they were not just looking at product design, they were looking at fair materials. Where do materials come from? Is it a long-lasting design? Can I reuse it? Can I, is it modular? Can I extend it? Exactly, I think, what, what refurbishing also is, is doing. Is, uh, but how can I help with the design to make that easier? That is the top right one. Then obviously good working conditions for where they, where, where they produce their products. And so what we then concentrated on is the bottom right hand one is reuse and recycling. So, and the interesting thing is one of their sheets, uh, which is very, very telling, 
and I've taken it out uh, and, and just to, to show it to you here as well. We need to unravel systems again. We're thinking too, too simplistic. Politics wants a soundbite. News wants five words. Then the people get bored and yawn. Um, but our systems are not simple. They are complex. But as I tried to show to you, we can unravel them. We can start looking at them in fair detail. One of the bit of the system is actually to understand where the metals come from, to follow the material chain. Here shown for gold, for, for the Fairphone, it's a mine in Peru, goes through the gold refining in Switzerland and then goes off to China and then comes back to the market. So we can track that and you have to track that for all your elements. Or is there blood on, on those elements? Is there some conflict on it or whatever? So it, the, the metals have to be clean. Not only environmentally clean, but they also have to be societally clean and, and morally clean. Very important picture. That is digitalization, the whole supply chain. Okay, getting to my specific part, and I'll just quickly zoom through these pictures, and then I'll go back to HSC to end off the, the talk. Is um, Here you have the modular design of the product. It's got seven modules. The battery is there. It's easy to take apart, very much like the old Nokia. Uh, you could take it out and buy a new one. Somehow everything's glued together these days, so you can't take it out. And so you have... Uh, the real interesting question is where do you put what on the module and what you shred and what don't you shred? That's a real question. So for that reason, we had three cases. We did more than three cases, but here are three that were published on the website. You take one mineral, which is the whole phone, throw it in a furnace and, get, and then separate the metals chemically. Lose the plastics, but recover the energy as best as possible in the technology. Create steam whatever you can do with the steam, um, you lose a lot of elements as well that way. This is what the flow sheet would look like to do that. I'll get to the HSC in a moment just to make that live. Then there's a second route. I have the dismantled bits and I put them in the right process chain. So I don't necessarily shred it up. I just put in the right process chain. But that means also I have to position the metals and materials in such a way on those modules that I can maximally recover them and lose as minimum as possible. So if you really go down to the type of depth with the models that I've shown, you can start doing that. You can't do this with the Excel sheet because there's no thermodynamics in this Excel sheet. Uh, in these models that we do, there is. And then you can have the extreme other option is you take out the battery, as shown over there, you shred it to zillions of particles, create a lot of entropy, and then you sort it again, create a lot of energy at the power station to sort it out. Then you add a lot of energy to separate it out chemically and create metals. So this begs the question for you to answer. How much modular design and how much shredding? And where is the optimum? Is there one optimum? Obviously, if you take this chair, how many materials are on there? I can say, say three or four. So um, perhaps you can shred that to bits and, and sort of use a magnet and, and density to separate the wood out and, and the, the material. But if you shred the material, you create a lot of sort of little pieces of fluff, which you also have to deal with. So the question is quite simple. In the circular economy, how much modularity? How much shredding? How much reman? How much, but even a remanufactured product comes back at some point in its life. Where's that cutoff? Where's that optimum? And it's different for each product. Now, if you would look at the product that I'm looking at, at the, uh, at the Fairphone, hopefully, and if you've looked at the, the, this material I've sent to you, you can ask yourself, well, what is the recycling rate on mass base? If I have 100 mass units of, of the product, how much metals will I actually, or how much material will I get back? Now, if, you've not, if you've looked at the notes, obviously you, you know the answer, but think for a moment in your mind's eye, what, what is your guess? How much of a fair phone, or may I even say of that thing I've got lying there, I once mentioned her name, um, will you think you can get back of the telephone you have in your pocket? Guess a number, see how close you got. Now, 
to really do design for recycling, you need to understand where each metal goes, each element. So I'd like to recover them because that is where the money comes from. If I lose all my gold, I'm not going to pay for this recycling chain. So what we came up with, we came up with a way of presenting uh, elements in this sort of flower arrangement where it would mean that if all the petals were like this, in other words, fully colored, all of them, we would have 100% recycling of each element. So we'd have a beautiful flower, in other words. But you can already see from this disjointed flower for the root number one that I'm losing a lot of metals in the process if I throw the stuff as is into the furnace. And we only selected uh, uh, that selection of elements from the whole body of elements. Otherwise, the flower would have been much more complex. So if I look, go to the next case, you'll see that I'm recovering different amount of metals because each process route will change the recovery of the metals. And even the third route creates even another picture. So what I'm trying to show with here, you can drill down to the element level, but some of these are only in a milligram level, but you can calculate it. Then you can redesign it to understand if it's critical, the critical element, you can understand how much I get back. So did you get that answer? If you say bottom right, is that your guesstimate you made? It's about 30 to 40 percent recycling of the total mass. This is a modular design of a, of a product that was meant to be environmentally friendly. Is, is it really, is that the number that you had? So what happens to the 60 percent? Now that's the question, if you do circular economy, you have to answer that. You can probably get by with a buck and you can make it work for a time, but eventually, that's what my professor many years ago told me, take care of the residues, because they're going to hit you and they're going to bite you in the bum. Then it could catch up with you. That's a slimes them or any residue that you create. So you have to manage that well. So any product is creating a lot of residue. You have to manage that uh, as well as you can. So, but the interesting thing now as well, since I have this flow sheet, I can also do the environmental footprint. I can do the energy analysis of it, which you can read in the second blog. I can do also the, the total life cycle of the product, and um, Fairphone calculated its 30% reduction of footprint by doing this modular design. So it's significant. So what we then did, because we did using a simulator, we can, on the one hand, calculate the metal depletion from the LCA side, global warming potential from the LCA side. Uh, we can try to get the optimum. It's a multi-criteria optimization problem. But at the same time, we can also get the energy recovery possible from the different routes. I can also draw for you an entropy diagram if I wanted to. Now, this is where we're starting to get at fundamental information. You're at a university. You shouldn't fluff about when you talk about circular economy. You should change the world if you want to do circular economy. So you need depth. That's why you're at a university. So you have to create that depth. You have to create the knowledge to do that. Don't fall in the trap that you get all fluffy talk because it's going to make you bankrupt in the end. So what does this all uh, led to is, and, and this is for me also interesting, that um, once we did this work, Greenpeace uh, contacted us. And they said, well, um, can you explain to me what, what you did? Because they were busy with this report, and they were sort of ranking green design, different products. And you can very nicely see that Fairphone got ahead even of Apple and HP, among others, also because of their transparent way of doing it, but also because of, among others, the work that, that has been uh, done, because they actually cited in the report and the question that uh, Greenpeace asked us, because if you go and read Apple's uh, web page, you'll see that they said that they will be using 100% recycled materials in their products. Now, what does that mean? For an uninformed reader, that means, oh, great. But 100% recycling rate means where's all the junk to create the 100% recycling material situated in the world. Because that you have to add. You can say it's 100% recycling, but you have to not forget that you're creating residues in that process. 
So if you use the type of models we've shown, you can actually calculate that. That's what you need to do. So that's statement there, and, it, and we discussed that, and, and that's what they actually then put into the report, is that there's still work to be done. There was a nice compromise, to put it that way. But that's your challenge to actually do it. So here, it's actually device complexity. There's still much room for improvement, both product design and take-back programs. That's, and also the refurbishment, which is actually linked to that. So I'd like to sort of leave you at that point, and that's my summary. I showed you all of those things. I tried to just show to you what circular economy is. <coughs> I tried to make some pointed statements. I'd actually hoped somebody would stand up and say, uh -uh, I don't agree with you. But you can uh, please do that because this is, don't get me wrong, circular economy is, is philosophically very deep subject. It goes to the heart of our existence. But we have to do it well. We have to do it openly, transparently, honestly. And what best is there to use physics, among others, to help us to do that? And to find the holes in the system um, to do that. I've also tried to show you the tools, as I said, um, this metallurgical internet of things, the importance of it to bring things together. And then also we have to uh, explain to consumers what the hell is this all about. And so that is extremely difficult for me. So I'm trying to get even help from you guys. If you want to help, please, please come uh, by. So to end off, I've gone slightly over because I started, I think, quarter past. Yeah. So I've got another five, ten minutes. So can I now just quickly go, I, I cannot show you the detail of, of the Fairphone example, because there's proprietary stuff in there. I just want to show it to you it's real. Yeah. And I just want to leave you with that message. So you can do it, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Don't tell, I'm not telling you, uh -uh, okay guys, uh, there's nothing to be done. No. That's why I, otherwise I wouldn't have you as a PhD student. There are some others in Freiberg also, which I share with other professors as well. So we're trying to, to fill in the gaps. And we're doing some, you're doing closed loop example here, there are other people involved. So we're trying to all fill in the gaps in this way. But let me just go back to my Windows version uh, of, of my uh, software here. Just bear with me, you know now how long it takes. I'm doing good advertisement here for Apple, huh? <laughs> I, I really like this, the way you can just jump back and forth. And this oh, thing is... Yes, I know, but, that, <laughs> but I've got all the other advantages. <laughs> yeah, well, I always ask, uh, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this, but a pretty well rich man in the world, how much junk has he created with all his Windows versions? <laughs> Each new version required new hardware, new junk, new residues. Anyhow, perhaps that's very provocative as well. Just a moment. Yeah, sure, but, but <laughs> Apple is, uh, I've, I've got hooked on Apple's uh, interface. Um, but a lot of the software runs on a window, so it's the way it is. Any questions, by the way, while, while, while I took you all so silent? Um, If, if, if it was the 40% roughly that you got from Fairphone. Yeah, sure. So did you do real work on some other brands? Uh, if you look at the blog, there's a nice sentence that says, now, oh, we've taken the lead, guys. Please show us your number. Yeah, okay. It's on the blog. Yeah. So, you, so you need, you, that's the, 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 the beauty of, of the courage these guys have had to do it. Yeah. Now, that's what you need to do. You guys are creating new businesses. It takes courage to do it. You can just say, please go and do it, because that will change things. Sure. So I'll just show you case number three. Yeah. And just show to you that um, we have the input is the bill of materials. I won't show it to you because that is confidential. But I'll just show to you, this is the flow sheet. Uh, 
and then you can calculate it through and you go to the parametallurgy and you can calculate the recovery of all the elements there. And, and that's, I don't want to show any more um, because, as I said, confidentiality, but uh, it's been done. Uh, and I'll just show to you a few stuff on the screen um, just to show to, to, to you that. So this is where I think this is, these are beautiful uh, research areas of uh, how to bring this type of stuff into, into the design groups over here, which will look more perhaps at the, the product, at the, the optical stuff. And, and we as engineers would bring in this detail and, and harmonize those two worlds, because that is still my dream that we can, rather than have the bill of materials over here, we actually have CAD linked directly. And this can be done internally in a company. So here, here's the example that you, you, you saw uh, a, a moment ago. So uh, on the sheets, if I visualize the flows, you will see that stuff flows in. You take the battery out. We discussed that a moment ago in the view of your research. Then you take this shred it to bits and then sort it out and then you have all these different streams coming out. So for instance, here's a quick, I won't give you any data, but you see there's pressure, there's enthalpy, and there are uh, part numbers. Okay? So the mineral is not a geological mineral, it's a part number. It's also mineral. Now that is a, a key thing that, that you have to understand and that's what I put in the UNIP report, product-centric recycling was to mean this. People misunderstood that. They said product recent, I would take this product and I product centric, I take it around and I map it and I put a sensor on which also creates more entropy because the sensor gets lost somewhere and then I know where it's going. But ultimately product centric means what is the mineral of this? What is the mineralogy of this? What are the parts in it? And how can I separate it? So this is what you see here. You see uh, names. You, you see, but you don't see chocopyrite or galena or swellerite, typical minerals that we have in geology, you see a part number. So what's the difference? Doesn't matter. Then we have a pyro side uh, where we then would either put the modules into the furnace as in totality or we would put all the scrap into different and, and the parts into different bits of the flow sheet. I won't click on it because then you'll see some of the detail. But where details usually goes lost is in the smelt slag because I add extra stuff uh, for that slag so I, I can show that. But you can see, once again, it's not just a material flow, it's, it's a compound flow. It, it's got a temperature. It's, um, it, it's, it's more than just uh, um, just some element going through. It's something, it's a real mineral going through that. Okay, so of any of these streams, you will see uh, things of, of that going through. Okay. And ultimately, then I go to LCA and I have once again all these tools available to me. So I can analyze that system. Once I can calculate what comes back, then I can help the designer to reposition stuff wherever it has to go so that I can maximize recovery. Okay. So that is what I wanted to leave you with. Uh, obviously, if I do this, I can also do this in a course where we actually, and last week I did a course with people for two days where we did very simple examples. So I teach this to make people aware of it. We have a simple model and we have and link it to Gabi and we do an analysis of footprint. And, and as I said, I just wanted to sensitize you guys there. The tools are available. Make sure that you have a wide knowledge, that you understand a lot of the, the, the actors in the play, then you can do this. So with this, I'd like uh, to end off and thank you for your attention. And uh, hopefully you've seen something that you have not seen. And hopefully it excites you to just come on board and also do this. Because ultimately circular economy, as I said, is, is, is philosophically deep. We have to do it well. We have to do it extremely well. And you guys will help in that. Thanks.